Hello, this is Arun Malhotra and I am with you in ET Auto Unplugged. In ET Auto Unplugged, we take you through the different facets of the auto industry and to get a ringside view, an in-depth view, we get industry leaders and thought leaders to discuss the topic with you. The topic of discussion today is, in this episode, is the auto ancillary industry. Auto ancillary has been the news a lot lately because it is fitting in very well with India's China plus one strategy. It's just had a turnover, record turnover of $70 billion. And what goes into a, a vehicle, basically 70% goes through the auto ancillary route. And a lot of now upgradation, technological, other things are happening at the auto ancillary. The company's OEMs are becoming more as integrators. And we'd like to discuss on this topic. And for discussion on this, we have a special guest today. And I don't think he needs any introduction. He's Mr. Deepak Jain. I jokingly tell him that if we had a KBC quiz on auto, he will, the first question, the simplest question of 5,000 rupees, we'll ask the question, who's Mr. Deepak Jain? But that for the people who don't know him, Mr. Deepak Jain is the chairman of the Lumex Group. But along with that, he wears many hats. He wears the hat, he was the president of, just previously he was the president of ACMA. He's the chairman of the North India CI Council. And most importantly, he is a governing body member of the National Automotive Board, which is a think tank of the government for regard to all policies, initiatives. So he wears many ads. How he manages it, we'll discuss in the conversation. And uh, to best to Lumix Group uh, is a group which is well known. This is a group which has about 45 plants in the country. It has about 10 collaborations, international collaborations, and it has about 9,000 manpower on their roles at the moment at this point of time. But we are going to discuss the auto engine industry. So welcome Deepak to ET Auto Unplugged. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Arunji, and thank you very much for so this So Deepak, before we get to the subject in hand, we would like to know from you, your early childhood days, your school, your college, what you did, <laughs> before you came into the auto engine industry, and what were your passions and interests? Arunji, I'm the third generation into basically the family business, which is Lumas Group. So I was said I was born into the auto industry. Okay. Uh, incidentally, my name is Deepak, which kind of means the source of light. Achha. And the brand is known for lighting, Achha. which also is basically yeah. you know, source. So that's just on the joke apart. But I think clearly my introduction into the industry was in 1997. Uh, once I had graduated out and I did basically my graduation, I was Delhi born and raised and I went to the US for my bachelor's. Um, came back. Bachelor's uh, was in engineering, manufacturing? So, incidentally, my father was very, very averse that I should not be an engineer okay. by profession, although he wanted me to be in the auto ancillary business. And the mm -hmm. reason was very simple. He said, eventually, if you would take over the company, mm -hmm. you should be thinking out of the box. Mm -hmm. And engineers are basically trained to actually do and talk about specs. Okay. Uh, so that was his view. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyhow, I mean, say, as is, I basically joined the industry in 97. Uh, it's been now 25 years mm -hmm. uh, in this whole industry. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually proud and privileged and passionate mm -hmm. uh, about actually this whole work. Mm -hmm. um, so I think my brief introduction is that. Um, so. Uh, what are your interests in school and college beyond auto? I think clearly as any teenager kid would, I mean, so at that time the world was also very different. We didn't have any social media. We did not have this email fast communication. Mm -hmm. So I think it was sports. Mm -hmm. It was just basically mm -hmm. meeting and it also a lot of studies, right, to mm -hmm. actually get into bigger prospects. Um, I think when I went to the US, I think clearly uh, there was an appeal to come back into India. Uh, because at that point of time, I guess being from the family businesses, I was ingrained mm. that you must come back. Mm. And I would give that large credit to my mother, mm. who actually came in mm. and actually kind of mind-tuned me uh, mm. to come back on this. Mm. Mm. Okay, great. Uh, you came back in 97. And uh, before we discuss on the auto engine industry, we would like to know if you could explain to our normal our viewers, what is the ecosystem of the auto engine industry? How does it operate? It'll for a better understanding. So, as you rightly mentioned, that last financial year, the auto component industry, mm. the revenue in India was about 70 billion US. Mm. And it has come with a very handsome growth mm. of 30 plus percentage okay. over last year, right? 
Uh, That's much higher than the auto industry domestic sales growth. And it always will be. Uh, it okay. always will be because the auto comp industry is not just the OEM. It has export. It has imports. It also have aftermarket okay. to it. Okay. Uh, and of course, I mean, say as the industry is kind of migrating into higher technologies, there's more value add. But I think the fabric of the component industry is largely less than about 1,000 players who are largely in the organized sector. Mm -hmm. And I would kind of bucket it into three. Mm -hmm. One, of course, are the global MNCs who have come in, expanded their footprint, and I'll give a classic example of Bosch, which has been here for, I mean, say, a century, right? I mean, say, it's actually when Bosch is not a German prop, they say it's like an Indian-centric company. Uh, but then you also do have these joint venture partners, a uh, jugalbandi of such, of an India partnership mm -hmm. and global partnerships, right? Mm -hmm. That's the second bucket. Mm -hmm. I would categorize ourselves as a Lumax group mm -hmm. in that category. Maybe promoter-led, Indian-led, but also having a very, very fine balance to basically create value mm -hmm. for our customers with our mm -hmm. partnerships. Mm -hmm. And of course, a third are largely basically the owner-promoter-led. Mm -hmm. uh, they probably are looking and searching for technology partners to mm -hmm. TAs, still servicing a large amount of the component industry, and it could also come in into tier twos and tier threes. Uh, maybe the scale would be smaller, but I think the entrepreneurship level to deliver components, I think that's the man. So these are the three fundamental buckets, fabric of about 1,000 companies in the organized sector, mm -hmm. which basically is truly the replication mm -hmm. of the auto component industry. Very interesting. In so you talked of $70 billion, that's a turnover. Uh, it's good to talk in dollars because with rupees, it'll be even grow further. I mean, you have to multiply by 80. But if you were to look in terms of uh, number of people who are employed in the auto and industry, how much they would be? So I think there is an informal sector and then there is a formal sector. Mm. And I think the auto component industry, I mean, there could be numbers and stats which basically say that if the upstream is employing one is to two, I think the downstream, which is the supply mm. chain, mm. actually goes one is to four. Ooh, right, God. because you actually have to put in the investments you have to do, and it's a fairly large generator of employment, mm -hmm. uh, maybe around 2.5 million people. But in that sense, I think, I'm just gonna give you another stat. Auto industry truly represents the manufacturing of the country. Almost close to 50% of the manufacturing GDP of the country comes from the auto sector. And of course, it's massive mobility mm -hmm. as well. So I think truly there is a weightage on tax collections, on labor propensity, as well as in terms of just going into world-class kind of manufacturing practices. So great, 50% of GDP comes, manufacturing GDP comes from auto. Absolutely. So if the auto industry sneezes, the whole industry, industry will catch a cold. Well, I, and I hope it doesn't <laughs> sneeze too much. We <laughs> just basically can into the form of I'm just speaking on that, it sure. catches gold. So that's a very interesting, and you said the number of people who are employed to it, and it's, that we'll discuss on that industry a lot there. You came back to the business or joined the business in 97. And I remember 97 was a time which was, I would say, the second or the third revolution in the auto industry. Sure. A lot of players, foreign players, were coming into India. That was the phase, whether it's a Hyundai, whether it's a Deu, whether it was Volkswagen, whether it was Honda, and whether it was Tata also came with their passengers, it was Indica. So you came at a very critical time in the industry. So when, if you look back on 97 and you picture your first six months or first year, what was the ground reality at that point in the auto industry? I mean, so I was, this was probably my first entry into the India market in the yeah. auto. So I mean, so at 97, I was just a 21 year old lad with basically, you know, big dreams. Yeah. Uh, I had actually trained in Japan, uh, okay. post my education in the US. Yeah. Uh, I'd also trained in the Detroit belt in the US. Okay. Um, and I would say, to be honest, I had to do a lot of unlearning. Uh, you know, India is unique. India mm. still is very, very unique. Mm. Um, and I think to be a part of this industry, I think you need to be very passionate. You need to understand manufacturing, the shop floor ethos very, very well. Mm. Um, and I think India has its own dynamics, so which we can talk later. Mm. So there was a lot of unlearning. It's not a cut, copy, case model globally, although you are part of a global supply chain. As you rightly said, 97 also was something where you were just expanding and there were multiple collaborations happening. 
maybe you said third revolution. The second revolution happened in mid 80s. Mid 80s. Right? When Hero and Honda came yeah, in, yeah, Suzuki and the government of India came in, and the rest is history, as they call it, right? Yeah, After absolutely. four decades. Uh, but I think it was a very interesting time. And uh, I can also say, and I can also relate, that I came in at a high. Because if you remember 96, 97, it was booming the industry. Mm -hmm. We opened it up. At 99, it went completely crashing oh. down in 2000, <laughs> right? Um, so I think for me, the introduction to the auto industry, introduction to my company in India, was basically going on a high, but actually just going back into a doom. And I, I think it showed and had a lot of interesting, not just anecdotes, but a lot of learning uh, for me at that time. So you know, you said that after your education, you trained in Detroit, and then you went to Japan. Correct. Detroit and Japan would be as different as chalk and cheese. I, I would assume, you can correct me. And then you came to India. True. So, you know, you have that, kete Brahma, Vishnu, Mahesh, all the three circles <laughs> you have to bond. You said you have to unlearn certain things, and you, but still, there are certain basic principles which you have to keep intact. I just want to identify, tell, tell me what are the two, three things which you thought were still relevant and two, three things which needed to be unlearned or relearned. I think clearly, as I said, the manufacturing is a core. And irrespective of any region, any country, any geography, uh, I think auto ancillary, you need to be very, very manufacturing focused. Mm -hmm. The second, I think, is a global phenomenon. This industry has to be very, very customer centric. Mm -hmm. And this is something which I early on ingrained mm -hmm. in life, mm -hmm. that auto industry is not basically what you do, but what customer wants you to do. And if you're able to value create with the customer, mm -hmm. I think you're in a better spot. So these are things which are consistent. These are things which I continue to learn, continue to enjoy. But I think the things which you need to unlearn was that India dynamics are very different. Uh, you know, it's a very large country. Every state has its own dynamics, own geographies. Today we are, a, and at that time also, 97 also, we were actually giving opportunities where we were making partnerships. I remember we were at that time creating a plant for Hyundai. We were predominantly in the Haryana state, in Maharashtra state, just opening a plant in Tamil Nadu. Tamil Nadu. And you know, it's not, you will never find that in US or in Japan, <laughs> what different dynamics are. So I think for me, there was a lot of unlearning mm -hmm. where you do it. Um, and also I think this ancillary business is such mm -hmm. that you need to rely and have a great partnership with your technology partners. So how do you manage that? How do you co-create value for the Indian market, right? Giving their global alliances. I think that also was very, very interesting for me and a new learning, not necessarily unlearning, but a new learning for me. And technology partners in different domains, totally different domains. Well, I would say at nine, early, late 90s, I think the still the, I would say priority was on quality consciousness, on manufacturing. Okay. It was not so much on technology, it was not so much on engineering. You know, the customer wanted at that point of time that we must have great quality. So I think there was this whole quality movement which mm. started in 90s okay. and continued till probably 2000 to say that, listen, we want to make best in class components uh, try and get basic quality. At that time, I remember getting a Deming Awards. Uh, Deming Award, much Bobby. coveted of this thing, right? <laughs> Most uh, coveted. Much coveted this thing. Today, I mean, say so you have many, many GIPM winners, mm -hmm. Deming Award winners. Quality has become hygiene. But at that time, I think everyone was chasing quality. So the sharp focus on quality came from the 97 period when all the manufacturers came in. I think 90s. I mean, say so Maruti, Heroes, you know, they're so really kind of... foreign technology coming in, vehicles coming in with Absolutely. much more, you know, fits and finishes of much more precision required. So that made this change, which was absolutely, said, huh? absolutely. And that time, if you remember, I mean, not too many engineered vehicles mm -hmm. were done mm -hmm. in India. Mm -hmm. They were actually done in mm -hmm. Europe, in Asia, mm -hmm. or somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then they were built in for basically making a build for manufacturing. I remember somebody told me the pre '70s there used to be a term called BB. NP, which meant build but not produced yet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what quality could focus on that if it's built before that part of it. Now coming to, I mean, so a lot of manufacturers came in across the board and they were from Korea, they're from Japan, they're from Europe, they're from USA. So how difficult it was or challenging it was that, you know, different countries of origin, they have their own dynamics to combine that in that phase of time. I think I will give this credit to our uh, chairman, uh, my father. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he had two rules in life. He mm -hmm. said, never say no to a customer mm -hmm. 
and the partnerships, whatever you get, mm -hmm. let's try and basically see from their perspective mm -hmm. what they want. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this was the most interesting part for me. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you basically mingle the cultures? How do you explain India? Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, if you have done India in six, seven states, mein aapne business kar liya, it is kar equal liya. to having a six, seven cultural mix of different <laughs> countries, right? So six, seven countries, one side, six, seven states, one so, side. So, so I, I think that was a great balance. And I think over the years, we've been able to develop uh, certain basically competencies of how to manage partners well. But I think, as I said, for us, the true etho is that you need to be customer centric, customer focused, and continue to create value for what your customer needs, hopefully proactively rather than reactively. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where the auto ancillary spot is globally and more so relevant in India. I'm just asking a question. Without naming a company or individual, could you, do you remember one or two interesting anecdotes which would highlight what you have said? I don't the, want you to name companies and individuals, but interesting anecdotes which told you here, these are things which still stay in your mind. No, I, I, I remember uh, when I joined in, you know, 97, 98, one of the companies had just started in India. Um, and, you know, their expat who was basically responsible for quality, he was in India and he was, uh, you know, we had a quality issue when I trained from Japan as Japanese culture, I went there mm -hmm. and I said in Indian way, mein bol diya, uh -huh. yes, sir, sorry for this quality uh -huh. issue, you will never have a problem. You will never have a problem. So they said it. And uh -huh. he was a very, very matured senior person of the industry and again as a said expat. So he said, come son, don't you like my job? Don't you like me? And I said, no sir, why? <laughs> he said, well, I'm a quality in charge. And if you say that quality will not come, then my job will be finished. <laughs> so he said, you know, please understand this is India. There are many variable factors. Yeah. As long as you continuously improve yeah. with a good intent yeah. to yeah. ensure that quality's problems are resolved, yeah. that is fine. Yeah. Don't over promise and <laughs> under commit. Okay, that's very interesting. That is what basically You know, we, we Indians sometimes have a habit which is there, you know, we over promise and then we fall into that trap which Absolutely. over committed without really having the fundamentals in place. Now, starting from 97 since you came in, there must be some basic landmarks or some inflection points over the years which you think would have changed the course of the industry sure. beyond after 97 what would they be i think one of the first inflection points was just after 97 you know if you remember 2000 mm. uh, that was a year when the industry actually tanked collapsed, collapsed. and collapsed right and i think the mature <coughs> markets at that point of time mm. had a lot of history to basically manage degrowth, whereas India at that no. point of time did not. Okay. And I think that was one of the first time the industry got challenged with a massive degrowth. Mm. And not just the OEMs, which actually do have a better bandwidth, but the tier ones, tier twos, tier threes. Mm. Mm. And I think that kind of gave a lot of learning on how basically we should manage degrowth. India will have its own ups and downs which comes through. Mm -hmm. And also, there was a lot of investments which had come in because of this whole new era of, let's say, economic liberalization, mm -hmm. where a lot of investments came. 91, those so you had borrowed at a very high cost, made investments, and prior to what that... What was the interest rates at that time? If I remember correctly, it was somewhere close to 16 to 18%. My God, virtually double. It was you? double, right? And, and, and I think, of course, we were in a high inflatory environment, which is but fine for that fine, growth fine. perspective. But I think that just was a wake-up call for the industry that you will never basically mm -hmm. be just growing. You would see downturns, and you had seen previous downturns, but not on a probably scale where you had made massive investments. Investments because of the I think new those, that was the change point. Mm -hmm. I think post that, you know, there was from 2003, 4 recovery, there was a growth, but then you obviously had the Lehman crash. Oh. Right, if you remember 2008, yeah. it was a global. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal crash in... So you have to understand that India had its own dynamics and mm. truly as an economy globally, mm. it was still kind of insulated from global shocks. Mm. But it's the first time because of the magnanimity of that shock, mm. India also dipped. India, there was a lot of chaos. And there, if you see, India recovered also mm. in a period of almost less than 12 months. Mm. So it was actually a crash, then we actually went in. Mm. Showed resilience of India as well. Mm. There were, of course, I'm not talking about, there were so many prior to that scams, which happened in India, stock market, but I'm giving more from a reflection mm -hmm. on how the auto industry is behaving. I think after that, if you see, 
there has been just on this point please. it also coincided with that you know although there is no relationship with the auto industry but the 2611 bombay blasts which were there yeah. and uh, they put a lot of negative sentiments people went to their shell so that also was coincident with absolutely i mean say i mean say prior to that you also had the 911 in the us right and you had the whole terrorism okay. thing uh, but also if you see and, and we can discuss it later you know there was also in india maybe before the modi regime a bit of let's say coalition government mode mm. which happened for three decades yes yes you absolutely right right so i think you are living in an environment which has kind of a coalition government i think there is mm -hmm. intent of economic liberalization mm. as an auto industry you are now integrated with the global supply chain mm. because you is no more now a uh, premier padmani or only a uh, indian Limited centric volume. vehicle mm. you actually have global players coming in mm. eyeing that market even the volume being small and you also have eventually also an export opportunities mm. so there was what was grappling around but the focus was let's make great quality products mm. let's try to focus on the manufacturing let's try to basically ensure the liberalization and i must take one minute more to just mm -hmm. say that while you're doing this mm. you have to also understand that there was a lot of ir unrest yes is that something which is there there was a time when you know that the militant labor unionism was was there very strongly at that point and time, I would, for various reasons and i would perceive it in a way that as india is was a very young mm. and is still as a very young country mm. our independence is 75 years mm. in that i mean so we started truly auto component manufacturing from mid 80s which is just 40 years so the unionization and the managements will also go through its learning curves mm. right so that is where i would say there were many many inflection points which came about mm. in the indian component industry and the auto industry which actually will give later on more resilience more scale more maturity to handle better things going forward so very insightful you mentioned lemon brothers which impacted india i mean there was i mean part of the global eco global value chains it impacted then you talk to the coalition government which is always about stops and starts and you keep looking right left center and then you talked of this labor unionism which is part of thing one thing i still remember uh, and uh, you can correct me <laughs> after lemon brothers we went down and you know people said oh the world is lost and four months later we had to again shoot back so start. how do you deaccelerate and again accelerate you know it's like saying that i'm just going down down hill from 80 to 20 it's no go back to 80 immediately so uh, and i think you know this is again a nature of the industry if you look at cv industry mm. it goes through its own mm. cyclical industry we also have to understand the auto industry is cyclical in nature mm. it can never be up and down but in a long term of four decades mm. it has been on a slow up curve mm. Mm. right and i think what my view of lehman was very simple that the india had a big base still not so coupled with the global economy mm. that it cannot its mm -hmm. own resilience could give a okay. hockey stick remember mm -hmm. all right and i think that was truly what was reflected in basically the cycle you still think holds true today even well i think no it doesn't okay i i think as you aspire to become the top 3 economies globally mm. as you aspire to take a bigger mm. um, let's say value chain order mm. in the global value chain Mm. you obviously will be more coupled mm -hmm. with the global economies mm. but i think i remember when i was in high school hame bolte the population is basically the biggest liability <laughs> what we have this was actually taught in books yes, uh, that you know what biggest yeah. thing is population biggest evil is population mm. so much this thing today i think my son is taught that population is actually the boon the demographics dividend is the boon an honorable prime minister just spoke <laughs> yesterday it was incredible that yeah, you yeah. basically talked about the diversity the demographics uh, that basically is what is going to demographic dividend which is being talked of it was Absolutely. always said that we are too many mouths to fill and too many feed and you know how will we do in this so, part of so, it so, so, so now if you look at this auto and civil industry and also from the ogen perspective you know although we may say auto is one but two wheeler is one passenger vehicle is one commercial vehicle is one sure. and even mm -hmm. although we don't consider them in the conventional auto industry but tractors and see earth moving equipment also is one so if you look at these diversities of these industries and when you do the auto ancillary business are there some any diff 
what is common and what is different in these set of so, industries? So I think you've rightly said that this is again a unique to India. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you talk about auto industry, go to Europe and talk to my partners in auto industry, they'll say, no, listen, that's just four wheelers, pass cars. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think clearly in U.S. there is a mm -hmm. distinction between the trucks or the commercial mm -hmm. vehicles. Commercial, they cars. call them the light trucks. But yeah. India moves on two wheelers, right? Mm -hmm. We have the largest market. We have been consistently performing mm -hmm. as a high engineer product. You have the pass cars, the different segments, mm -hmm. which is, and every segment has its own behavior, mm -hmm. which comes through. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the opportunity mm -hmm. what India has mm -hmm. to play with. Mm. Uh, I think as an ancillary business, of course, it all depends on what kind of components you're producing. Mm. Uh, we've been lucky that, say, one of our product lines is lighting systems. And lighting systems go across segments, mm. and that you can tap across segments and do it. But mm. in this, I think every segment is unique. We have to build in capabilities to cater mm. to different segments. And we'll start from the customer need, which actually will be on frugal engineered to get the right product mm -hmm. for basically India. And I think you need to have a very, very close customer centricity and engagement mm -hmm. customer to that. So the basic principle is still the same, but you need to know your customer well and fine tune your offerings, products in the service that thing. Absolutely. But the basic principles auto and will not dramatically change, which are Absolutely. there. Absolutely. Now coming over the years, and we talked of, you know, <laughs> this entire two, three impacts, inflection points with the Lemon Brothers, with the coalition, with the, this broadbanding which came about because initially time was this license for Kota Raj that you could only manufacture this. If you were a license for 150 cc, you can't produce 200 cc. That went by the wayside. In terms of government regulations or I would say external regulations which are not from the customer, what are the changes happened from say 99 to 2010? We'll come to the last five years, but next 10, 15 years, any major things you remember? I think from 99 to 2010, I think clearly there was an aspiration for basically the government to move the auto industry because its impact on the economy per se. But it was fundamentally done on certain knee-jerk reactions happened. You know, mm -hmm. certain regulations changed just coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a fuel economy pricing which basically mm -hmm. came in. And I think the auto industry, if I remember and if I can correct it out in early 2000, mm -hmm. I think there was definitely a lot of engagement mm. by the industry leaders in the political corridors to talk about very stable mm. and consistent policies, which unfortunately mm. we could not get mm. because there were certain various coalition governments coming through. Mm -hmm. But again, the industry is lucky because you have a whole massive consumerism. You understand the auto industry is dealing with an aspirational buy in the past car. Absolutely. It is also dealing with moving the common man mm. in the two-wheeler segment. Mm. And it is dealing with the whole mobility sector on transportation, on fleets, on everything in the CV. So if you encompass it, mm. you actually have various needs also catered in different segments, not by segments, but also in different economic strata within the population. Mm. And hence, I do believe that first and foremost, the whole economic liberalization of even getting the investments into India, I think that was very big policy, mm. which actually encouraged the auto industry. Mm. From a protectionism, and you used a license, Raj, which was more <laughs> in before, before <laughs> my this thing, and it also was, you would call it in the industry 1.0, if you would look at. Uh, I think that to go into getting investments, global investments, liberalizing the mm industry mm. where you could have actually a hundred percent kind of investment coming and you remember there was so much a press note keeper mm. on getting the NOCs those were mm. a lot of mm. things which came in but eventually if you have to become a part of the global supply chain mm. this is my personal belief mm. that you need to compete from a global fair point market a level mm. playing field so protectionism is not the I would say competitiveness how do you enhance your competitiveness? And competitiveness usually come in when there are certain threats, there are certain competition environment becomes better. Absolutely. And I think that's what happened from basically the early, late 90s to say 2010, 2012. And this gave the industry the ability to start, and as I said, manufacturing best in class components, mm. best in class vehicles, mm. so that you're able to have a platform 
where you could compete. Of course, I mean, say you needed some protectionism mm. or you needed some kind of you level playing field up. because, it's, you know, global markets are not fair. Mm. And India had to be nurtured to mm. come to that aspiration where mm. you can become scale as well as technology mm. uh, and the whole ecosystem needs to be developed, mm. uh, which basically will not only kind of inculcate your domestic industry, mm. but also then make you compete at global levels. Mm. Now coming to you know one area which you discussed uh, when you discussed the auto sale industry is the the spare parts or you know the market uh, yeah. aftermarket. I remember one of the challenges in the aftermarket a few years back was that if X amount of items were sold in the aftermarket, only I say 0.2 X were from the original sure. manufacturers, and used to have this typical I don't nothing against the Chandni Chowk market or the Crawford market in Bombay, but OGL, without bill. So, you know, what you got, the vehicle you got on a high quality stuff, but what you finally ended up putting up later in terms of when you did replenish your vehicle or you yeah. had the repair, when did it, has it changed and how much has it changed now? I think definitely it's changed and let, let me give you this thing. What you're saying is an outcome of being a formal informal. and an informal sector, simple. Okay. And as there are going to be more vehicles on road, you have to understand that safety. We are talking about vehicles, even two-wheelers, which are highly engineered product. Mm. And they need to be safe. And as even Aqua, we have been for decades talking about the Asli Nakli show. Asli. We have been trying to teach basically the consumer that you need to take the genuine parts. Mm. Look at now OEMs, they want to basically build it in their umbrella mm -hmm. through their service network, through the dealer networks, a genuine part kind of given. Mm -hmm. Where, I mean, say the whole formalized structure, but still today, I mean, say a lot is largely mm -hmm. informal, there's imports happening from mm -hmm. across countries, competing countries mm -hmm. globally. Uh, but again, it's eventually the right of the consumer. Mm -hmm. If we are not able to be agile enough to actually deliver to mm -hmm. the consumer need, he will find basically the import. But largely, I would say, uh, even if I remember the stat correctly, you have a $10 billion aftermarket in Aqua. So of large. the 60 billion, 70 billion, mm -hmm. there's about 10 billion, this which is, is also healthy growing. Is there. Mm -hmm. uh, and it will grow further. further, right? But I think the formalization of the sector needs a much more closer cooperation by the regulators, mm -hmm. by the OEMs, by the supply chain, because we want to give safe, reliable products to the end consumer so that, you know, you don't get into any safety issues later. Mm. There was a question which a lot of people used to say that the laws in the country, when they wanted to tackle the counterfeit or the, the spurious products, they were not strong enough. From the time, from the case to the conviction was very poor. Has it changed? I think the laws are there, uh, but I think the enforcement of laws mm. is a concern. But again, I personally feel it's a continuous cycle. It needs to not just be enforced, but it needs to be taken as an awareness platform. I think that's an important part. Awareness and education are important because uh, if you demand... And I think there's a lot of work which has happened, um, but especially in the last few years, within the umbrella of, of Siam, ACMA, and even mm -hmm. through the direction of mm -hmm. MORTH oh, yeah. and MHI, to say we must make road safety we must talk about product safety mm. as ever. And I think I have no doubt that if we aspire to be the top three markets in the world, mm. if we start to basically formalize GST, mm. which has been one of the big economic tax reforms, mm. has really helped mm. this cause mm. of actually formalizing the mm. sector. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure, I mean, say, there would be more and more enforcement, awareness, and formalization of the spare parts sector. In the last few years, we've seen a lot of focus of government policies on emission and safety. Sure. And uh, if I have to play the devil's advocate, a lot of people are saying there's too much focus of, on emission and safety is only ensuring that the mass consumerism, or you can say the, the people movement into mobility, whether in two wheelers, four wheelers, is adversely impacted. What is your view on this? So let me give a backdrop to it, right? I mean, so first, maybe let's understand what do we aspire to be? Do we aspire still to be just a two-wheeler market? Do we aspire that bicycle say two-wheeler, we are happy with it? Do we aspire that two-wheeler say entry segment is happy with it? I think we understand that what is the aspiration for this industry? I think initially this aspiration was fine. Today, I think 
at least I aspire, to actually have a bigger chunk in the global value chain. Mm. And when you talk about global value chain, you need to compete with basically all the markets at a fair level playing field. For which I think you need a very, very strong technology roadmap. Mm. You need a very, very strong mm. basically safety, emissions, also technology roadmap on future advanced mm. technologies. Mm. So that a vehicle built in India is fit and worthy mm. for a global market, mm. including India market. Yeah. Right? I think that's where if you aspire to be, you will continue to see this push on regulations. You will continue to see this push on this. I think what the industry needs, Idly, is time, is a very, very good engagement to say, we need a stable, basically, policy deployment. I think industry will be happy to do this, and I think there has been a lot of engagements to get to that level. Mm. So if there's stability, no knee-jerk reactions, uh, engagement which is obviously at least mutually mm. not agreed upon, but at mm. least mutually accepted. Absolutely, right? absolutely. That actually helps out. One thing, you know, I still remember about 10, 15 years back, back a lot used to be said about we are 96% indigenized, 95% indigenized, but then something happened in the last 10 years when the, the way the automobile was designed, and you know, we used to have a branch of mechanical engineering only when mechatronics came in, electronics, software, autonomous, you know, anything which was there. Somehow, did we went into a sleep life planning wrinkle? China just moved ahead and we became dependent on others. There's nothing wrong in being a, a part of the global value chain. But some way, did we miss the bus at that point of time? We definitely did. And I think very seriously, you have to see mm. right now what is happening. Mm. We have a $20 billion export, right. but we also have a $20 billion import. And, then, and still China is the number one in the import. Well, I think, you know, you said China plus one. I mean, so you cannot ignore a country which is the world number one in the market. Absolutely. Right? So you will, irrespective, will have to. It's like, why doesn't people talk about US plus one? Right, I mean, you <laughs> basically are talking about a number two market. Mm -hmm. So I think the clear point is that India has a massive potential mm -hmm. to still grow its manufacturing footprint right. Mm -hmm. But we, I think, need to make a very collaborative effort mm -hmm. across sectors of manufacturing, mm -hmm. across, let's say, educational institutions, across with policy and definitely this engagement of Jugalbandi, as I say, about OEM <laughs> and the ancillary mm. needs to be much more Stronger. now intertwined and stronger. Mm. So, if we look at it, you know, now the focus when we say that manufacture in India, make in India, initially the definition was very, very, you can say, limited, make in India meant manufacturing in India. But it was realized that you have to design India, develop in India, supply chain in India. So, make in India doesn't just start from that and that's the realization which has dawned upon. So, when do you think this realization has come in a big way that make in India cannot be seen through the small prism, it's seen through a broader prism? I think for the auto industry, it was way before. Um, you know, I always give example of the two-wheeler industry. Sara localized, uh -huh. it was a localized supply chain. Mm -hmm. We engineered it all this mm -hmm. in India. And believe me, they have a global benchmark. You are mm. the world leaders. You yeah, have absolutely. competed with any of the competing economies. You're actually taking the export market. I think. It not enough has been talked about as a two-wheeler industry person. Mm. And if you're able to get these examples, mm. shining examples, mm. and take it and kind of emulate it mm. in all the other sectors, mm. in auto or non-auto, mm. I think you can really build that basically competencies. Mm. However, as technology changes, and it's not in India, it's a global phenomenon mm. which the whole industry is getting disrupted. Mm. It's your 150 year old Kumkaran, you're basically kind of <laughs> said, okay, let's wake up. And then you want to basically run it in the next 50 years. And, and that's Kumkaran used to wake up and go back to sleep. I hope that's not happening here. Well, I, I think <laughs> the global plethora is such that we all know that there is going to be a massive trend of disruption. And again, I say India is going to be unique in that way mm. because at least my view is we will be having multiple mm. basically powertrain options, which is going to be good for India, which is going to be good for the consumption of India. So many powertrains, so many technology we're talking of, you know, CNG, hybrid, flex fuels, hydrogen fuel. Doesn't it confuse the issue? I think uh, it doesn't confuse. I think we have to accept all. Um, you know, the worst thing today, what you can do is just bet on one technology. Okay. Akuma has always said, 
you know, the component industry has always mm. said that let's try to be mm. the technology agnostic. Let basically the end customer decide. And I think every company, based on its own intelligence, mm. own risk-taking appetite, is actually building these competencies for securing the customer orders. And I think India itself, being at this great demographic dividend it is, mm. you will have different kind of portfolio. And you also have to see our energy mix. You also have to see mm. basically our infrastructure mix. Um, right, and that basically will give a different kind of scenario. And as I say, it's the same thing which I learned in '97, which holds true. That don't cut copy paste. Mm. We need to talk about India solutions, which is good for India, but with a global mindset, where global. India can then compete with basically these skills um, globally. I think that's the ethos. So you are uh, you are in the governing council of the NAB, National Automotive Board, which takes a very holistic view of the industry and policies which are there. But we hear a number of things. Sometimes we hear production linked incentive, advanced cell chemistry, fame policy, central government, import duties, state government regulations. How does it all tie up together? And how does, is it simple to navigate or it is still a complex jungle? I think let's, let me try and simplify this, right? I think we have to first and foremost have a very strong alignment with a stable roadmap mm. between the policy makers and the industry. And as I said, it may not be agreed upon, everyone may have their own mm -hmm. interests, but at least it needs to be accepted. And I think there is largely an acceptance, there is a great direction, a vision, mm. you're right. Second, I think in this, we need stability. Stability of policies, stabilities of action. Mm. And I think if you look at the whole make in India, the government has actually facilitated a great scheme. There have been multiple PLIs mm -hmm. which have been announced. And PLI for auto, there is, if you compare it with other sectors, is a bit different. Oops. We have talked about whole localization. The advanced is technology... Is it more complex? No, it's not. It's simply, I mean, so if you look at the advanced technologies mm -hmm. eventually, you have localized at 95%. In mm -hmm. five years, if you are not basically localizing more, because the new technologies are not getting advanced, mm -hmm. you'll actually come back to 90%. Mm -hmm. But here there is a PLI incentive mechanism mm -hmm. to say invest, and we will try and give you the incentives, right? Mm -hmm. Third, I think the great part is about the center and state. Mm -hmm. If the state is also giving certain kind of facilitations to the end consumer, mm -hmm. I think that will just help to grow this mm -hmm. industry. Mm -hmm. And I think there are multiple, and this is what the industry is saying, let's target multiple technologies. Mm. Why don't we let the end consumer mm. decide what it wants? Mm. The more India, and India is aspirational, the youngsters are aspirational. They will see as long as basically, they are getting the number of choices, they are basically getting number of powertrain choices, mm -hmm and the technology choices. Mm. Today, you know, we talk about globally autonomous, we talk about connected, we talk about electric or hybrids or whatever you want to call it, and we talk about safe. Mm. You know, all this shared or safe, right? In mm. India, also all these trends will come. Okay. Now, coming to a part, you know, after the COVID struck, and we became, we said we were more global, we to improve our technology, whether it's an emission. Your ecosystem of the auto industry is made of tier one, tier two, tier three. Tier one, they have the resources, they have the technological collaborations, they have the managerial bandwidth. How, what is happening on tier two, tier three? Is it is it a weak link because they say the the, the strength of a chain is equal to the weakest link of the chain? So before I just answer this, let me talk about because you said COVID struck. I think the first and most important insight was that we are part of the global chain, and we are all vulnerable together. Yeah, absolutely. I think. That dawn realization was not there before COVID because mm -hmm. some event happening somewhere, let us say, mm -hmm. in Japan, some mm -hmm. event happening in China, some event happening in Malaysia, some event happening in Europe, everything used to come for a standstill. <laughs> right? I, I mean, so it was incredible. And mm -hmm. I was fortunate that I was given uh, to service the auto mm -hmm. component industry as the ACMA president during that time. Mm. Right, um, and I think I could see at very close quarters how vulnerable mm. the global point of view we were, and we had to deep dive. So I think what happened was you had to make it very transparent. Mm. 
mm. where you're really getting this. You know, we had these semiconductor shortages, you had these container shortages. <laughs> I used to call it every month there was a flavor of the month ice cream. I Hindi film song, Ek ko manao to dusra ruk jata hai. So, and aapko pata nahi tha ke kaun sa dusra hai, kal kaun tisra hai ga. So, so those were the things which actually happened, but I think what you realize that the whole supply chain is interlinked. Mm. We always used to say, but are they able to gear up? I'm just saying they're linked. Which see, see what has there. happened after three years. They're all basically resilient. So, so you see a lot of things. So, so, a lot of, so tier one is responsible for hand holding, out guiding them. The uh, OEMs may be also responsible, but I'm sure that you have that. You can say, I won't call it a legal responsibility, a moral responsibility, yeah, or a I, business responsibility. I think, I think we have the responsibility as tier ones to grow our tier twos, to grow our tier threes. Mm -hmm. And you also, also understand that tier ones, tier twos, there's a flavor. Mm -hmm. As a tier one, you're catering to the big OEMs. You're also buying from big raw material suppliers. So that's one aspect. But I think Abjabol in tier two, you're talking about the MSME, MSME which sure. basically is the most impacted. Most vulnerable during most impacted. the thing, right? Yeah. And I think there were certain government policies came in, but we have to talk about strategic MSMEs, strategic yeah. SMEs, yeah. where basically you do it. And I think one thing which also clearly came about that fragmentation has definitely happened in tier two, tier three, okay. by tier ones. And maybe now, everyone is talking about quality, everyone's talking investments, so mm. it needs a lot of consolidation yeah. as well. Now we come to the, coming to the last part, we are talking this China plus one strategy. That's, uh, if you open a newspaper today, you can't find this title missing somewhere. Now if you hold a hand to your heart, I mean, we cannot, I mean, the idea is not to replace China. As you said, the idea is to build up our footprints and become more global. What is our speed, if you have to give on a scale of 1 to 10? So, I think clearly you will not see... I want a number. No, so, so let, let, me, <laughs> let me put it first, qualify. I don't like this China plus one. You don't like it? I, I mean, say... Sometimes, it's become the buzzword. Well, I mean, say that's uh, up to the media. We have this <laughs> nice media to thank as well. But I think clearly what... The government is also talks China plus one. It's yeah, not the media you only. You can talk about plus one, plus two, plus three. Mm -hmm. I think what you're basically saying is yeah. that there has a more de-risking and on a country, hmm. you have to prove capability of manufacturing competitively hmm. to basically get it in world order. I think it's been a wake up call for everyone. And I do believe that in the next five years, hmm. because manufacturing is not something which you start. It doesn't tomorrow. happen now, off and on. You can't you switch it off. You have to start five years with a very robust domestic industry also happening. Hmm. You will basically have more export opportunities. Hmm. You're seeing clearly a lot of basically exports coming in and moving hmm. into China. Hmm. I think for me, most important is. Are we as industry focused on brand India? Mm -hmm. What does made in India stand for? Mm -hmm. Does it stand for quality? Mm -hmm. Does it stand for competitive pricing? Mm -hmm. Does it stand for affordable pricing? I think we still need to deliberate and get that thought process right. So what Deepak, I'm getting from you, don't get obsessed with China plus one. The obsession with the quality India brand, if you can raise, obviously you'll go up. So, I mean, this China plus, the ratios will fill up in itself. Aap yaad hoga, I think at a Siam convention, mm -hmm. uh, chairman of Suzuki Motors, Mr. Osam mm -hmm. Suzuki had mm -hmm. come in and he had made an appeal to the PMO mm -hmm. in an open platform. I, I love make in India, but can you please add make quality in India as a quality <laughs> word. So, I'm again saying that if you are competitive and have the quality right, you know, you can compete with not just China, but any other economy. So you are saying, like, Arjun, your nishana, your nishana, ki taraf pura dhyan hona chahiye. Don't get, you know, diverted to all sides of the picture. Absolutely, yeah. and the opportunity, I think, is and just. And you are quite hopeful. The we have the resilience, we have the ability to go up further. I am ever optimistic. Ever um, optimistic or very optimistic on this? No, I am always ever very optimistic. Okay. I think the motorization curve. And if you look at the macro parameters of India, mm -hmm. I think we are just starting. Okay. So, if you just started, abhi to pehli manzil hai. Matlab, <laughs> hai, abhi there's a long way to go, but we are on the right track. Which is there. Absolutely. Now we come to the last part of it, which is the rapid fire round. So, are you ready for the rapid fire round? No, no, no. So, there are some questions asked. We need very sharp, precise answers. Uh, am I getting no? a gift hamper or something no, as you're doing gift the current job? <laughs> <I'm just laughs> yes, since you. you're not competing with anybody, <laughs> we'll send you the gift hamper anyway. So, <laughs> if we have to really move up this global value chain which is there, and uh, you're doing three hats now, what do you think the OEM should do? Collaborate and basically build a supply chain on technology hmm. and competitiveness. Technology and competitiveness. Mm -hmm. What should auto ancillary do? Follow the OEM blindly, invest for the future, don't shy away. 
from investment, mm. believe you will have cycles, but have the ability to resilient, and COVID has taught us mm. to be resilient. And what do you think the government should do? I think stable policy framework, mm. whatever you have laid out is great. Engage with the industry more, and if there are any fine tuning required, please do it, but not on knee jerk reactions. And one area we have not talked about, what should academia do? Well, I think I would say industry needs to first focus more on academia mm. and collaborate more. I think the onus lies on the industry. Mm. There are a lot of actually now initiatives. Mm. IIT is a brilliant example, mm. a lot of incubation happening. Absolutely. And with the technology changing, mm. we need more and more academia. Okay. So we have OEMs, we have auto ancillary, we have government and we have academia. Two ideas to build up the symphony. That it, it is a symphony, it is not a mishmash. So again, I'll glow with a very simple thing. I think we need to create more forums mm. where all the three stakeholders or four stakeholders can come in mm. and not talk about basically academia talks about academia, industry talks about industry or government talks okay. about government. Right, that's what happens in silos. I think we need to basically look at one big objective, oh, yeah. getting a global value chain, and then say whatever needs to be done. And I again say industry, it's onus on industry, not on the government, not on the academia, okay. to actually invest. So you're saying they, they, they ask what you can do for the country, not the country they can they do invest to industry hi And okay. I mean, that's why I said they don't shy away from the investment. And I can make from your talk, your confidence for the future is high. Oh, I'm Not sorry. only because you're a staunch optimist, but you also see things happening on the ground which is leading the future. I, I, I think uh, I consider myself very lucky. Uh, you know, I'm an inheritor, so we call <laughs> it the, you know, the lucky guy who comes in. And that's why I think that you're the right time. Yes. Fortunately, I'm at the right age. Mm -hmm. where I can see a great 10, 15 year so horizon. If we, we just had the figures from ACMA, 70 billion dollars. If suppose Deepak Jain has to say, what will happen in 2028, 2033, what will be the figures? Is 70 billion in 2028? Well, I, I think clearly, if even you're just growing at about 12, 13% CAGR, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a no brainer that you should double that out. Okay. But I would say that 70 would actually be higher than 150. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, it's not just volume, but also value, mm -hmm. which will actually go up as India is moving at a much aggressive growth, SUV curve, mm -hmm. higher segment, higher CC, new technology. So it definitely is going to be higher. Um, and I'm hoping that 2033, I'll put it in a different way, that you're actually number two in the mm. world. Mm. Simple as that. I mean, it's not okay. probably number you're one. You're a different league in itself. It's just uh, we have to think global. Global. We, we cannot be just only think numbers. local. Yeah. Use local competencies and scale to actually start thinking global. So, Deepak, it's been a pleasure talking to you and getting insight. I've been educated and enlightened. I'm sure the, the listeners, all viewers will also be educated and enlightened. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Thank, thank, you. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. much. Thank you.